they're doing is uh, streaming live on Facebook. Uh, so they, they will be going around talking to, to some of you. So please, if they do walk up to you, please be nice and accommodate them with uh, a nice conversation. All right? With that said, it is now my pleasure to call upon the good Reverend, Rev. Walter Mambazi, to come and introduce the keynote session. One of the major issues in events such as this one is time and time management. So I will do our best to stick to time. We realize that this next session has been allotted a one hour slot. So we will stick to that. I, I, I was having conversations earlier on with the keynote speakers and they protested vehemently about being squashed in terms of their presentation. So we will try to ensure that in the one hour from the moment I say now, we will accommodate the entire session. So starting now, <laughs> 9.37. So today I actually have, uh, first of all, I should say that it's an honor to stand here today to introduce two men that embody the conference theme of building businesses to last. And as business sustainability and growth are really the crux of why we're here today, we are looking at two central themes about building businesses to last. That is having a winning strategy and being a good steward of a company. Now, to speak on these topics, we have two very well-known individuals that I'll introduce in a moment. The first one is an economist who studied at the London School of Economics. He is an eminent businessman who has created leading businesses in the textile, manufacturing, travel, banking, and advertising industries, and more recently, real estate property development. And he serves on several corporate boards and holds a distinction of having been the longest serving chairman of the Times Print Pack board. Now, this gentleman is the son of a former freedom fighter, Dr. B.J. Devalier, and a prominent member of the charitable Rotary Club. As part of his keynote, this gentleman is addressing the conference on the topic of finding your winning strategy. So what I'll do is uh, I'll ask us to put our hands together as we just ask him to come through and sit right there. So a hand for Dr. I'm sorry, for Mr. Ravia Devalier. Okay. So, Mr. Devalier, you just go take a seat at one of those two nice-looking chairs over there. Around as he goes to take a seat. The second gentleman is a qualified engineer and holds a doctorate in business administration and enterprise. He is a multipreneur and church leader whose ventures include successful businesses in the agricultural, machinery, ICT, manufacturing, construction, and petroleum product sectors. So, it's pretty, pretty much a lot of things. He's a chairman and board member of several prominent institutions and this man is also an ordained bishop at Grace Ministries International and he will be giving his keynote speech on the topic of are you a good steward. A, a round of applause as we welcome to the stage Bishop Dr. David Nama. So Doc I'll ask you to go and sit right there as well and then from there we're going to go straight into the first speech. Now do remember that um, Entrepreneurial success is never a straight line, and so over time, successful entrepreneurs have developed strategies to survive the difficult times and come out on the other side stronger than before. Now, these entrepreneurs have cracked the code on how to win even during difficult times. So successful entrepreneurs demonstrate important traits of resilience and rapid recovery that help them to achieve growth in their businesses even during challenging economic times. So to give us the first keynote address for Nyamuka Zambia 2017. Let's put our hands together as we welcome Mr. Ravi Devalier speaking on finding winning strategies. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend. When we have a Reverend as a moderator, you know that God is with you, right? <laughs> Thank you for the smiles, because I was just going to say in my speech that, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself, before you have your cup of coffee or tea, you see a miserable looking face, don't you? <laughs> then somebody told me that, just try to smile, a fake smile. So I smiled. And then you know what? After a few, couple of minutes, I really started smiling and I felt good. I felt positive. In the same way, you know, when a person next to you yawns, what happens to you? You yawn. When you see a, 
a yawn on TV, what happens? That person is not next to you, but you yawn, right? So, there's a thing called self-fulfilling prophecy. And this thing of self-fulfilling pro prophecy has happened in my life as a businessman. Because when I started my business, I was even younger than you. When I look into your eyes, I see hope. I see, how can I start a business? I was studying in England. I did my A-levels in Wolverhampton, then economics in London School of Economics. I was 22 years old. My brother, who was running business in Livingston, passed away. They were running a clothing factory. So my dad sent me a message, come back to Zambia. I, I was about to go for my, my master's and my doctorate and whatnot, but then I had to rush quickly and I said, oh God, my world has collapsed. Because my world, if I had continued, I would have become a professor in some college or university in England. But I came back and I, my father had been through a rough life. It has been mentioned that he was a freedom fighter. So he started the freedom, his freedom activity in 1948. And by the time, in 1962, he had sent nine people to study in India. Amongst them, Dr. Mbikusita Luanika, uh, Namaya's grandfather, uh, Simon Kapwepwe, Arthur Wiener, Sikota Wiener, um, Mungoni Liso, uh, Mr. Lisulo, Mr. Sipalo, etc., etc. Et so the British, the British, I'm sorry, uh, you know, I shouldn't be speaking because UK Aid is one of the uh, sponsors of this thing. But the Brit in any government has their special branch, so they made sure that the business is collapsed. So by 1962, my father's businesses had gone down, and um, just before the uh, the, the um, 1964 independence. So when I came back from England, my business, our businesses were quite down. All my other brothers said, this bus his business, a little shop, cannot feed us. So I joined my father's business. But he had just bought a dress factory called Manhattan Fashions. We ran that factory for a while. And then Dr. Kaunda came up with his humanism part one. Some of you may be too young to realize, but when that happened, Oh, a lot of businesses started closing and the business went down. Then um, we had to sell back the factory to the owners and I was running that little shop. After a year or so, I said, no, I must start my, my, my factory. So I, without money, with four secondhand machines, I started a factory called Cleopatra Fashions. Some of you are old, will re remember that factory. Within... For six years, it was the biggest factory in Zambia. We had 250 machines. We were manufacturing 1,000 dresses a day. Now, the point in question was, how did I expand without money? So I used to cheat people. You know, when I used to, to sell my products, they said, how many machines do you have? I used to say, 20 machines. I used to advertise front page to, to, to show, you know, how big my factory was. But meanwhile, it was small. So this is where the self-fulfilling prophecy comes in. But by the time I came back, the orders were huge. My factory started expanding not only to 20 machines, but 50, 60, and 100 machines. So when you think about starting a, an enterprise, please do not be disheartened. Money will come if you have passion. If you have passion, you're convinced that you're going to do something, even if the competition is great. They said, no, you can't start this. When my dress factory started, there were 50 dress factories in Zambia. They said, no. The market is flooded with dresses. But you create a niche for yourself. And once you create a niche for yourself, you know what you are doing, you'll succeed. In 1979, 80, uh, time started changing. The Chinese goods started flowing in. Salaula started coming in. So 100 factories in Livingston closed. I said, what should I do? I said, fine, let me just go to Lusaka. So in 1985, my family shifted to Lusaka. That's my wife and me. In a little, we stayed in a little, um, on Freedom Way, opposite, next to VK's. You know, VK's in Freedom Way. A, a little flat, two bedroom flat. We stayed there for two years, started a shop, top shop, uh, in Society House. David, your, bu your uh, building, Society House. And from there, we started a, 
uh, a travel agency, Magic Carpet Travel and Tours, and also Prudence uh, Bureau de Change. From there, we grew, made a little money, started Prudence Bank. Then we'd, we expanded as a bank. And we had a little problem because the situation, economic situation changed in Zambia. And then 10 banks had to close, 10 local banks. So my bank closed. But luckily, um, integrity was our policy. And <clears throat> after the bank closed, we said, what should I do? Oh, God, what should I do? You remember God at that time. <laughs> you know, when one door closes, 1,000 doors open. We, we went into some other businesses, advertising. Then we started Magic Advertising and Promotions Limited which today is the only composite branding and advertising company in Zambia. So, no, the Reverend is not standing up, I'm looking at him. Because when he stands up, he's going to say, Ravi, your time is up. <laughs> so that's how the, 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 we overcame the challenges. Now, the previous speaker said something very important. He's Scottish, right? He's not here. Bruce has disappeared, right? So I'm, I'm going to talk about another Bruce, another Scottish Bruce called Robert the Bruce. Now, Robert the Bruce, in the, around 1200, whatever, I'm, I don't know the exact date, was a, was a Scottish warlord, a, spot, a Scottish king. In those days, the Scottish used to fight the British, and there was a war going on. Now, he was beaten eight times. So after having beaten eight times, he said, my God, now my time is up. I should not be fighting the British. I must give up and let the, I mean, sorry, the English, and let the English take over Scotland. So he sat in a cave, took off, took off his armor, put his shield, and he started crying. He cried, the tears dried up, and he fell asleep. While he was sleeping and he woke up, after he woke up, he saw a spider. The spider that had started making a web went up, fell down, went up, and fell down eight times. But the ninth time, the spider went the other way. And then somehow created, started creating the web, and it completed the web. So Robert said, okay, I've been attacking the, 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 the English in a particular way. Now let me change my tactic. So he changed his tactic, approached it differently, and you know what? In that battle, he beat the English and he, he, then he went right into England. So this is a true story, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking about persistence and having passion and guts. You have to have stamina in business. <clears throat> no matter what you do, <clears throat> you have to be persistent. Do not give up. Do not ever give up in your pursuit. I've had it in my life. Now you talk of long longevity. My grandfather came in 1896 to Zimbabwe. Yes, in 1896, he was a teacher. He started a small business. Then he had nine children. From those two nine children, two sisters came to Livingston. In 1930, one sister came in 1935, that's my mother, and started Devalia's Emporium. From there, they grew. They had a bakery. They had a mineral factory. They had a, a laundry a departmental store and a restaurant. They grew, 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 and grew. Then he invited another gentleman, the, the sister's husband, you get a brother in marriage to join the business. They grew as well. And then they separated and started, and they went on their own. Today, in, in, um, in Lusaka, we have Saro. How many of you have heard Saro? So Saro Agri Industries. That's my cousin. I am Devalia Group of Companies, and there are many other people who are in business. Now I have, because I used to be with my father, he mentored me, he made me, um, he taught me business, and he taught, he taught me how to face adversity and how to, how to come up, and how to crack the code. Remember what we were talking about? Cracking the code? Ravi Devalia is talking, going to talk about cracking the code. So that's the thing, persistence, and stamina will crack the code. This is how we came up, that's how we started business, and now I've got my son with me, my son Aditya. He's also in my business. Now my grandson, who's little, also comes to the office, he takes pictures, sits on my table, we take pictures. 
and the confidence is built. So there's a line building up. You wonder how the, the persistence and longevity will continue in your business. That's the way you do it. Some of our leaders haven't even run a shop and they, they, they think that they can run the economy. So this is the point. The point is you have to, I'm sorry, but what I'm saying also is that on the other hand, you have to work with the government in power. If you do not work with the government in power, you do not, uh, do not have the support. You do not have the wherewithal to do your business. Because when you grow big, what you need is the support of the government, the support of the NGOs, the support of, of, of the churches, and everybody. Because forgiveness, if anything happens in your life, if you have a fight with anybody, if you have a fight with a banker, if you quarrel with, a, with an investor, forgiveness is the best policy. I mean, you look at Jesus Christ, you look at Nelson Mandela, you look at Mahatma Gandhi, what did they do? They forgave, for, forgave them. There's no need to compete with your, with your uh, I'd say, competitors. Because competitors can be your friends. You can shake hands, you form a committee, and you form an organization where you exchange notes on your clients, on your customers and everything, and you move on. The mistake that people make in business is that they start quarreling with a competitor. Oh, I've got a dress factory. Uh, Mr. Piri also has got a dress factory, so he's my enemy. No, he's not your enemy. Shake hands with Mr. Piri. Say, hello, Mr. Piri. How do we work together? If I'm short of material, I'll go and get your, you know, I'll borrow from you. If I'm short of cotton thread, if he's short of cotton thread, I'll lend him the cotton thread. So cooperation is a keynote and very key to success. You know, I think it was um, Winston Churchill who said, if you do the same thing over and over again, only a madman will think that is going to give you a different result. So when that spider fell the eighth time, it said, no, I've got to take a different approach. I'm not mad. So he took the different approach and it succeeded. So in life, what I'm saying is, do not be afraid of change. Knowledge, people say knowledge is very important. I say, yes, knowledge is very important. But you know what? That's not going to take you to your destination. Only the other thing that you require is imagination. Einstein said that knowledge will take you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. You have to be nimble in business. If you have a problem in a particular situation, change. Be very quick. If you remember the British in, in 1400, whatever it is, fought the, the, the Spanish. The Spaniards had massive galleons, very big uh, ships, and they had gold. They were rich. People said, Queen Elizabeth, you lose against uh, the, uh, the Spanish. They're going to beat you because you have very tiny ships and uh, you don't have that much money. Those people are rich. They've got all the gold from South America and they're collecting all the gold and they'll finish you off. They've got huge cannons, you know, on the big galleons. But Queen Elizabeth said, don't worry, I've got Francis Drake, I've got uh, uh, Jack Hawkins, I've got so many people who are very nimble and very sharp. So you know what? These little ships, they maneuvered and they trained their, 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 their little cannons on the side of the ships. And they blew the, the ships. And you know what? The, the English won the battle against the, the Spanish. The reason they won the battle was because they were nimble. So the idea in life is to be nimble. If you have any uh, adversi ad adversities coming up in your life, nimbleness will al always take you out of that problem. And you've got to be ahead of your problems. Plan. Planning is very important. So these P's, passion, persistence, and perspiration. Perspiration stands for hard work. And without hard work, ladies and gentlemen, you'll never come up. But what I urge you is think about the two most important things in your life. The time you were born and the time you die. You're already born, right? 
But one day you'll die, and you know what? You'll think in your deathbed. I can assure you, you'll think of two things. You'll think of God, and then you'll think, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. So I encourage you that I think I still have three minutes, two minutes standing. So, you know, you, uh, what, what you'll think about is that I wish I'd done this and that. If you don't take up your challenge, you have 0% chance, uh, chance of failure. But if you take up a challenge, the plan that, you're, uh, that you have at your desk, that you want to do, you have at least 50% chance of success. So please go ahead. Even if you lose this talent competition, there was a girl called Jennifer Hudson in one of the um, pop idol contest. She lost. She, you know what uh, that guy said? What's his name? The, uh, Simon. Uh, Simon said, this is a rubbish. He even said, this is a rubbish uh, song. You'll never make a success. And you know what J J Jennifer Hudson did? She won the Oscar in acting, and she, she's one of the greatest singers in, this, uh, in, in the world. So with this, uh, um, a few words, ladies and gentlemen, if you need any more advice, please come to me. We'll have a chat because when I see in your eyes, I see myself in you. I wish you all the best. Please go ahead with your projects and God bless you all. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Great, great, great speech. A big round of applause for Mr. Devalia. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, a great round of applause for Mr. Devalia. That was a great speech, and remember, there will be a Q&A after this, so he will be able to come through. Uh, but what I'll need to do now is immediately introduce the next uh, subject. It is on the topic of being a good steward, and the issue is, why is it important to be a good steward? Being a good steward of your business helps you build a business that lasts. And by focusing on growth, relationships, brand development, entrepreneurs who are good stewards serve not only their company, but also their customers, employees, suppliers, and stakeholders, making the company more attractive and valuable to lenders, potential employees, and external partners. To speak on this, we now invite, without further ado, Dr. David Nama. Are you a good steward? Um, good morning, um, everyone. I simply say all protocols observed uh, because of uh, our time. Um, as you know, part of my heart um, is um, I'm bishop, so I just want to quote a scripture uh, even as I enter into my encouragement uh, this morning. I think it's more of an encouragement because really if I'm going to speak adequately and share with you the insight of, of entrepreneurship. I can't cover it in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, so I'll just give you a story. Uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, uh, the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy says, So then, men ought to regard us as servants or stewards of Christ, as those entrusted with the secrets of life. Verse 2 says, Moreover, it is re required in stewards um, that one be found faithful. And that's a, the, 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 the topic that I was given to share with you, stewardship. Now, when you are talking about uh, stewardship and from where uh, we are coming from as, as a business, and when I say we, I mean I and my wife, um, two things really changed my life. One is the hippo experience and the two is the plain experience and I'll tell you this. But having said that, I think it is very, very important to acknowledge uh, Namuya who is doing very well uh, with this um, initiative uh, which is a great initiative and we would want to, to say congratulations and also I would want just to encourage her that in terms of the price tag, every time we are going to host this tag, uh, to host this conference, we are going to give you 10,000 to enhance, to enhance the, um, uh, the price tag uh, so that we can have as many people as possible entering into it. 
the hippo experience. The hippo experience is um, a resolve. I, I grew with my dad uh, in uh, Namwara, although I come from Tinsali, uh, Kafua River, he was a fisherman. And, um, and every day, I, I, you know, I give this, this experience all the time, and, and, and I hope it will encourage somebody. Because I, we didn't, I'm, I'm not coming from a well family. I'm coming from a humble family, typical Zambian um, village, Chinsari family. Uh, but it's out of that I made a resolve. And it is very, very important to make a resolve in your life. You must come to a point where you are saying, this I can't proceed, I must take a different direction. I know that you will have up and downs, but that is okay. That's how life is. So early in the morning, every day, dad would come and take me into, into the river to fish. And I'm told, uh, fish is caught in the night. So we'll go in the night, every night. And one day, when the rivers, when the Kafue River was burst out of its banks, and we're in the midst of nowhere, and as we are doing our business, uh, uh, this hippo came. It was approaching at, at a very high speed. And the dad tried to run away from it, but you know you can't run away from it. So at some point, he decides, rather than running away from it, let me face it. And so he faced the hippo, and as it was coming, it then realized that uh, I think I'm meeting my equal, and then it disappeared. That's how we went back home. And when we, we went back home, I told dad, dad, I want to see you. And so I sat with him and I told him, uh, you know, I am very happy you have brought me this far. Um, you have given me education to this, to this platform. And um, um, I'm so grateful. But this life, I'm not going to go through it. <laughs> so it is from that point, you, I made a resolve and everything that I needed to do was, you know, was, 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 it was designed in that line of resolve. And as we went on uh, in that resolve, I found myself at a place where I needed to make a decision. And quickly, um, I, we, we began uh, in, in, in cooking oil uh, with, the, um, with, with my, my wife uh, and then began to grow the business uh, in, in multiples. But what I want to, to let you know, that life is a lily. You hand over your life uh, to the next generation. Uh, the question is, after this life, what are you going to hand over as a steward to the next generation? Um, someone said, if you want to know the past, look into your present circumstance. Um, and if you want to know your future, look into your present action. When your present action works on your present circumstance, you can secure your future. Don't worry about what happened yesterday because somebody didn't hand over the lily properly. You know, our grandfather maybe are not running as fast as they are supposed to be running. And, and now you have this life, and when you look into it today, you find that things are not working. But your action of, 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 of today, what you are going today, with your resolve, it is going to give you your future. So we began in the cooking oil, taking advantage of opportunities because to every problem, there is an opportunity. It is a problem because the opportunity is inside. And it is an opportunity because the opportunity is outside and the problem is inside. So every time you see a problem, as an entrepreneur made or created, uh, it is argued in many, in many classes of, of, of education, you, 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 if you can solve a problem, then you can move on and make it in life. And that time, the issue was cooking oil. That was the problem. And we entered into that cooking oil business, and the Lord blessed us from, from that end where we went into minibuses, and at minibuses level, and I'm, I'm telling you about different phases of, of life. So from the, the cooking oil, we decided let's go into, into, mini, into mini buses. The mini buses were involved in an accident. Uh, all of them are almost at the same time. And, and remember that when you, you fail in one thing, does not mean you are a failure, no. In fact, I always say, failure is, is an opinion, it's not a fact. 
The fact that you failed, your mathematics failed in business at one point does not mean you have failed. You just didn't go in the right direction. Because failure, as you know it, uh, and I'm, I'm giving it to you, is just an opinion. Even when you fail mathematics, it's just an opinion because you didn't follow some professor's opinion. And so if, if I'm going to make my own mathematics, some professors are going to fail if they don't follow my opinion. <laughs> so someone who is said to have drowned is someone who goes in the water and stays there. If you come out, you just fail in the water. So as you move into entrepreneurship, don't think any time things go wrong, don't pack your, your bags and say, I have failed. No, just sit up, understand your situation, find somebody you can relate with, and move, move again. Because someday, you will be a successful person. Nobody is meant to be a failure. Every one of us is destined for success. Yes, someone will ask you, did you have failures in your life? Yes, as we began, as I'm telling you, these minibuses were involved in an accident. Then I realized, let me go back to cooking oil. Because this cooking, cooking, oil, uh, cooking oil business, uh, we ran it for almost two years. Uh, within that two years, there was the Mwambalu Chamber. When they took over the president for four hours, they rooted our cooking oil, and then we went back to zero. And another person took our money, we went back to zero. Then I began to go myself to sell cooking oil into Sesheke, into the border areas. I was involved in an accident, flipped three times, and then I picked up my pieces and moved on, moved on with a broken windscreen. But I went on and reached my destiny, and here I am. If I tell you where we are, the Lord has blessed us. If it was not so, I wouldn't have told you. <laughs> but it is persistent. You fall, you rise. You fall, you rise, and just focus on your journey, there you get where you are supposed to be. So this cooking oil fails. I go back to, uh, to, 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 I mean, the mini buses fails. I want to go to cooking oil. And this is where I want you to see the cracks of the issues, how God works out. I am at Dean's Prayers on Kafue Road. Um, a number of us maybe are not, you are not yet born, so you wouldn't know. So I go there, I'm looking for a spare part so that we can get this, this vanette move so that I can continue with, the, with my, my cooking oil business because the buses have, uh, you know, have, were broken down. Now, that, during that time, the most important thing of these mini buses, the Nissans, was a fuel pump. It was an electrical fuel pump. So I had two spare fuel pumps in my house, just in case one of them goes off. Now that these two minibuses are off-road, those fuel pumps became like a spare part that I didn't have anything to do with it. And this is how God works. So I'm going to this, uh, to this shop. I'm, look, I'm, I'm trying to get uh, pistons for, for my Nissan. And then someone from Chilanga Cement comes. He was a foreman and he was looking for fuel pump for their vanette at, uh, at, um, at, um, at its Langa cement. So then when he saw that I was talking about the same model of a vehicle, then he says, look, I've been looking for a fuel pump. And that time, it was very difficult to get for an exchange. So there was no spare parts every, anywhere else. So I told him I had one. So he said, OK, bring it to Chilanga cement. That's how I took that. Uh, by that time, I was working for Zesco. I uh, was staying at North Mid in one bedroom flat. So one bedroom flat can produce 10, 10 rooms. So don't give up. So I took the fuel pump at Chilanga and they fitted it. Then he says they needed a second one. I had a second one. I gave him. Then he comes and he says, so now we want to pay you. It was 65 kwacha at the time. So I had 130 kwacha. So he says, how are we going to pay you? I said, you pay in my name. He said, no, we don't use names. Uh, can you find a company? We pay into that company. Then I realized, hey, they will get, someone can get my money. So I came into town and registered my first company, David Nama Enterprise. And I took that company to Chilanga. They, they cut a check. I took it. The first bank I ever uh, had relation with was Standard Bank. 
and I gave my, my check there. It, now it was from there, things by, began to work out. Then they gave me another, when they are sitting in their boardroom, they are saying, but there's David Nama who supplied these, uh, uh, these uh, fuel pumps. Can you try them again to see if they can, they can do that? And from that end, they gave me another inquiry of land cruisers. And I, I fished around uh, for the prices. I quoted. I didn't know where I was going to fight these, these spares. But I realized, wherever they get these spares, I'll find them. <laughs> so that is an entrepreneur's spirit. But, you know, you need to be very, very focused in what you want to do. So I quoted. I found some, spares, uh, some prices somewhere. I quoted Zanga Cement. And they gave, they gave us... Um, you know, that, um, uh, that order. It was a lot of money. It was around two something million at the time. And you can buy a vehicle. And that's how the Lord progressed. From there, then they began to give us many other things. So as we, as we went into, into, this, into these businesses, I found myself at crossroads from one time to the other. But what is important for you is that business, business flies on two wings. There is the wing of character. There is also the wing of charisma. The wing of charisma pushes the business forward, but the wing of character stabilizes your business. Make sure in your performance of business, ensure that your ethics are right, your integrity, th integrity thinking is right. Do what you are supposed to do at any given time and do it right. When you go to the bank, make sure that you don't mess up with your bank. All those people, key people around you, who are very crucial, you know, to your, to your business, make sure your integrity levels are very high. If you are going to make it, ensure that you stay with the, your integrity. See you on top as you move into this entrepreneurship. God bless you. Awesome, awesome. A big round of applause for Dr. Nama. You know, by God's grace, we, we have, I've had this privilege, like this is the fourth time. It's like sitting there and I'm facilitating. So... I always find it a pleasure. And Dr. I mean, Mr. Devalier, awesome story. Really able to give us some great perspective. I believe for those of you that are sitting in the audience, definitely we're going to see how we'll fit in your questions. You do realize that we're really battling with time. We have about roughly 24 or so minutes before I have to hand over. Remember I said starting from the time I said now. So there's about 24 or so minutes. So what I'm going to do first is going to ask a couple of questions. So you've got microphones in front of you, uh, Doc. You're going to mic there as well as Mr. Diwali. There's a mic in front of you. So what we're going to do is go person by person. And the first thing we're going to do is to appreciate you for sharing your experiences. And each one of you definitely heard what the other said. So uh, uh, on, on a twist here, let me start with Mr. Diwali in a minute. What, what would be your take on the theme that he, ta he tackled of being a good steward? Well, uh can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. The theme, you're reversing the role. Yeah, now. I'm reversing the role. In other words, in a minute okay. or two, what, what would you say to, in addition to what the doc has said? Well, amazing, because I hinted, if you remember, about my family line, yeah. 1896. Our businesses uh, have been alive since 1896. So this is 121 years we're running our business. And we hope that our business will run for another 100 years. As I mentioned to you, my son, my, the grandson, it's amazing, but as uh, Mr. Nama said very rightly, integrity is very important. For, you've, got to be, uh, you've got to have integrity to yourself, because if, before you can have integrity to other people, you've got to be honest to yourself. And if you're honest to yourself, then your business will grow. Your banker will immediately realize that you're, if you're going wrong somewhere, you've got to tell your banker, that your banker will help you. But if you don't, he's your doctor. But if, you're do if you don't tell your doctor your problems, then your problem can't be solved. So I think it was an amazing um, uh, topic, the stewardship. It's so important to keep your, uh, not only to make money, but to keep your money and do it rightly. This is where you should join organizations like church organizations, service organizations like Lions, Rotary. You know, I'm a past district governor of Rotary. The, the four-way test says, is it the truth before you do anything? Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it bring better friendships? And will it have, uh, you know, will it build bridges to everybody? So the four-way test is very important. Integrity is key, as uh, Mr. Nama said, to, to, keep, you know, to have stewardship um, of your wealth. Awesome stuff. A round of applause. 
Okay, so, Doc Bishop, sir, a reverse role. Winning ways in, in a minute or two. What, what, what would be the winning ways? I mean, you gave a lot. I'm still waiting for the plane experience. Tell us about the plane experience and the winning ways. I think that um, um, to win, uh, someone says success is a, is a journey. Mm. Uh, but what is important uh, in order to win, um, I, I borrow from Dr. Maslow's equation, performance is equal to ability times motivation. Now, if you can work around those variables in that equation, find it wherever you can find it, and handle your, 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 your basic needs in terms of your businesses, your cash flow, your financials, your balance sheet, and then your security, which is your, your, you know, your, 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 you know, your strategy, uh, your, your, your security, your safety, your ethics, and your actualization. If you, you can round up all those five variables, then you should be able to succeed in your businesses. Thank you. Very nice. A round of applause for the doc. Uh, in, in Zambia, I think most will agree that there's, there's another category of business coach entrepreneurs. And one of the most interesting things about entrepreneurs is when the big check comes in, instead of thinking of cash flow, they think of the Range Rover and the second madame. <laughs> but I digress. I digress. All right, so now on uh, another, another very key issue that's very common today, and I think would love to hear your take, both of you, I'll start again with Mr. Devalia, is the issue of mindset, because that's something that's been really highlighted immensely. In fact, I look forward to the debate that's coming later on a Zambians thinking too small. But I don't want to preempt that part, so please don't touch on that, because it would be great to hear the debate. But the question is mindset. What is mindset to you? How do you inculcate the correct mindset? I'll start with you, Mr. Devalia, then finish with Doc again. Well, you see, there are so many parts to success, to success as far as mindset is concerned. You have some young people who become successful, like Mark Zuckerberg. At the age of 16, he became a millionaire. Mm. Then you had Howard Hughes, who became a millionaire at 19. Then you had the um, Kentucky Fried Chicken and, uh, and uh, McDonald's, who were 62 and 68 when they started business. Yep. So mindset is everything about passion. Honesty, as I said, perspiration and persistence. If you have that mindset and self-belief, you've got to believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. Your mindset has to be firm and you've got to sacrifice first. The Reverend mentioned just a few seconds ago that you start buying new cars, you start having girls or partners or whatever it is. Remember... That for the, you've got to sacrifice first. You may not even pay yourself a salary. You may not even enjoy it. Remember I said I came, went into a little uh, two-bedroom flat in, in Freedom Way, uh, you know. So you've got to suffer. You've got to look simple. People will come to your house and say, your furniture is rubbish. Your car, you're driving, it's stopping ten times every day. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> Me, I've got a lovely suit. I've got a lovely car or whatever. But look, you've got to sacrifice, even at the expense of being humiliated. If you can do that, you'll succeed. Because it's all about accumulating your initial capital. Once your capital rolls and grows, you're fine. Then you can you know, play around with your money. Not play around, invest more in business and expand. So it's all about mindset. You've got to be ready to sacrifice. Thank you. Nice. Uh, Doc, sir, please. Mindset. Well, you know, sometimes you, you don't want to disrupt the thinking. Um, mindset is a boundary. You, you, are, you, you are put in a boundary way of thinking. And what I would encourage you is that you come out of your box. You begin to think about impossibilities. Uh, because you don't, you don't begin to think uh, every time you are thinking, you are thinking in a small way. Begin to be disruptive in your thinking begin to go into system thinking rather than linear thinking. And I think that um, if you change your way of thinking and refuse you know, to, to accept me mediocrity, you can get to a place where you need to go. Disturb your thinking. Go into system thinking. I love it, Doc. You actually did a presentation just a few months ago. You called it disruptive thinking. Love that. Now, <coughs> one more question before we open for questions and answers. Um, what would you wish you knew 20 years ago when starting in business that you know now? So, Mr. Devalier. 
that you think could change things? Abu, <clears throat> when I started my business, I thought I knew everything. I wasn't listening to people. <laughs> uh, so I would, but again, on the other hand, you know when a baby walks and tries to crawl and st tries to walk, I mean, uh, before, from crawling to walking, you fall, right? Yeah. That's the way you learn. And uh, so I wish I had known, uh, you know, I would have consulted more people because two, three people advised me a few things, but I didn't follow their advice. And I just did it my way. I thought I could do it. So I banged against a few, you know, things. But then I thought, I wish I had listened to, to some advice that was given to me. But look, experience is the best teacher. I mean, you can read books and books and books and books about positive thinking. About the, it creates a good mindset, right? You've got to be very positive. But only experience is the best teacher. So you've got to do it, not just by reading it, but by doing it. So, um, what else? Uh, but in the end, you see, what you lose in the swing, you gain in the roundabout. You may think that you've bumped into something and you've lost out. No, you might have learned something in the roundabout. So I have no regrets. Given a chance, I'll do the same thing all over again. Nice one, Mr. Devalier. Nice one. Doc, what do you know now, apart from all those great you, equations? You know, for me, really, I wish I, I understood that to give God to run my business when I began was going to be a great, a great um, uh, achievement for me rather than doing it myself. Yeah. Because what I have discovered... Uh, being uh, a believer, is that if you, if, if you take care of the things of God, God will take care of your things. If you take care of your things, God will take care of your things. And you're not taking care of your things is a difficult thing. Correct. Now, I can, I can tell you that if I go to my office 30 times in a year, I would have done a lot. I take care of God's things and God takes care of my things. And I'm successful. Yes, you are. You know, one of the most interesting things I heard from the doc the other day was that uh, he argues with the banks. I like that. I actually took leaf from that. And uh, last time I was being given pressure over my loan, I sat with the guys and said, guys, you need to listen to us. We're the entrepreneurs here. So let's discuss. Don't threaten me with uh, taking money <laughs> and my collateral. Now, what we're going to do at this stage we are going to allow for questions and answers. As you know, that can be extremely challenging. We're supposed to have had a system that would have helped us do this in a more speedy way. But, well, that hasn't happened. So we have to make do with the old method. So what we're going to do is um, we'll do two questions at a time. We have very limited time. So I will really request that whoever asks a question sticks to the question and does not pontificate. So what you'll do then is you have a minute in which to ask a question. So we'll do two questions at a go, so that one goes to Dr. Nama and one goes to, uh, to, to Mr. Devalia. And you will see just right next to, the, to that, they, there's a mic. Uh, I think I'm pointing at it there. And then there's another mic over there. So what I'll do is I'll ask two people, uh, a lady and a gentleman, to, to go to the mic. So any, any, anyone with questions? Okay. Okay, I can see. So we've got two. So there's a lady over there. So let's get the lady. And the gentleman has already gone, ma'am, you can go to the other mic. Oh, anyway, yeah, this side. So just, you can stay this side as well. And then what we'll do then, for the sake of time, uh, expediency, I saw a hand there. And then another, another lady, if we can go, okay, yes, ma'am. You can, you can go stand by that mic so that I, immediately they get to you. So gentleman, the gentleman over there, yes, you can go and stand by the mic as well so that we can be expedient. Yeah, just, just go and stand by the mic now. Thank you. So you can go ahead with your question. And then, go. yes. Is it on? Hello, testing. All right. Oh, say, um, say your name and where you're from and then the question. All right. My name is Moape. I'm from Startup Junction. Um, Mr. Divalia, Mr. Nama, always a pleasure. First question. Is it normal to feel like a pest whenever you're prospecting customers? Because sometimes I feel like I go to the same person's office five plus more times. Um, second one. We're always taught to look for the good customer, the one that uh, you can retain. But how do you know when you have a bad customer? Thank you. Okay, those are, those are very good questions. So um, then we can also go ahead, ma'am, with your question. You can take a seat. Go ahead with your question. I'm also taking uh, My name is Chivam Balopa from Groff in Zambia. Very inspirational 
experiences, gentlemen, and uh, I think uh, a lot of people here are inspired by what you have gone through and the possibilities that lie. Dr. Nama, I, I'm unfortunately have a question for you. Uh, when you started off, you talked about your hippo experience and the plane experience. Hippo experience, very interesting, but what's the plane experience? Thank you. Okay, so at least somebody has also backed me up. Thanks, sir. So let's go straight to you, ma'am. You can also ask your question. Um, hello, hello? Yes, oh, we can get you. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you uh, to the two presenters. My name is Sarah Nguenya from Supreme Oil. Um, my question is, um, I wanted to get your experience with the bank. Um, you start up a business without borrowing, but then you want the, your business to grow. You go to the bank and they ask you all this list of questions. Mm. So how do you get around? Because I don't think our banks are structured for, for the citizens. I think they are structured for a certain class of people. Thank you very much. Okay, good question. Uh, very, very pertinent mm. amongst entrepreneurs. Ma'am, you can go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you. My name, name is. <laughs> sorry. My name is Emma Mkumbi from Ian's House of Greens. Um, Mr. Divalia, you spoke of uh, creating a niche market uh, for yourself. Uh, first question is uh, when do you realize that there is a niche market? Is it when you face a problem or a need personally, or it's out of interest of a certain product? And two, how do you grow your business from um, being a niche target business to a wide market business? Thank you. Okay. Okay, those are very good questions. We've got quite a number. I hope you would, I, I can see your writing. Okay, great. So I think let's get cracking. So we'll start right there. First question was, um, um, two questions actually. One was the pest. How do you know that you're being persistent. Where does, where's the difference between persistence and just being a good old-fashioned pest? And, and then good customers, how do you know when you're dealing with a horrendous one? So, Mr. Devalier, bad customers, when are you a pest? And then Doc as well. You can answer seating so that you, you just take it easy. You see, uh, never give up. Um, even if you become a pest, you know, even a mosquito can bite. It's very small, but it still uh, beats you. It still bites you. So the idea is to get bitten, right? So the idea is to keep on being persistent. Wrong people. Uh, then the next question was, Dr. Nama, what is the plane experience? We, we didn't hear the plane experience. You talked about the hippo experience, but the plane experience. Well, you know, one day I was going to South Africa, and my, uh, my cousin is a pilot, so he... I asked him if I could go in the cockpit, so he allowed me. And so when we were going, we go on the runway, um, and I saw that uh, there were so, so many meters in the cockpit, but there were two ones that was interesting because I kept, in, I, kept, I kept seeing him concentrating on the two. One was the power meter, and the one was the other was the, the guilt, I mean the, the attitude, attitude meter. So when we were going into the runway, and then he puts this plane on the tarmac, and it was going, I saw the power meter going that way, at some point, he took off, he took off. When he took off, then the power, the power meter began to go down, then I saw the attitude meter going up, and he was concentrating on this attitude meter. As he went at a certain point, I saw that um, the, that meter was not going anywhere, it stuck there, and he relaxed, and he began to talk to me. Then I said, wow, what is going on here? Yeah. yeah, yeah, what is going on, sir? So he tells me, look, when I put my plane on the tarmac, my problem was I must run and take off at a certain point. Because if I don't take off at a certain point, I'll hit the trees. Yes. So that was my problem. So once I achieved that, then it is no longer my problem if I take off. Now is how high am I flying or how low am I flying? And so that experience brought me into the business arena. When you are doing your business, when you are crawling in the initial part of your business, don't delegate. Trust yourself. Suspect everyone else. 
and put in so much energy in the business because if you don't take off at a certain time of your business, you are going to crash. Business is meant to grow. And when it grows and you take off, your problem is no longer the power. I told you now I don't even go to the, to the office because I've put systems and things are running on their own. Your attitude becomes very important. Don't begin to buy uh, because Dr. Nama is driving a Mercedes MG today. Let me buy that. Your attitude in business becomes critical. Handle what you can handle. Don't handle what you can't handle. Be ensure that you're in a certain place at a certain point. If you do that, you have a plain experience and you go and land properly. Nice one. You know, so true. A very pertinent question from one of the ladies. She asked, experiences with banks, too many issues, how do we get around it? The perception amongst the entrepreneurs in this country, no one can argue with that, is they feel the banks are tuned to certain people. There's almost that feeling that they're just catering to a certain class and a certain group. Um, I don't think so personally, but this is a perception on the ground. And so we need that to be cleared, help people understand. But one thing you must remember that, you know, our, our very good sponsors, uh, Barclays, Cavmont and uh, Senaco, these banks have shareholders. So before they lend any money, they have to answer to the shareholders. They don't want any they have to minimize the losses, bad debts, uh, as far as overdrafts lending is concerned. But I'll give you my personal experience. <coughs> as Prudence Bank, all our employees were Zambian. We never had any Bangladeshis or, or Pakistanis or, or, or foreign uh, management. It was all Zambian, high quality. If we had, uh, my, my manager in Andola, Mrs. Malama, was actually Area manager for Copper Belt, and I employed her as, as manager of the branch in Andola. My general manager of my bank, Mr. Laban Zimba, was actually the uh, inspection director, a senior director of Bank of Zambia before he became my general manager, so on and so forth. So we had very capable, and we used to lend money, um, sometimes on gut feeling. I'll give you an example. There's one uh, uh, man called Michael Paschini. Uh, how many have you heard of the name? Handyman's yeah. Paradise. Yes, we have. So he was a young man, came to my office. He says, Mr. Divalia, I want to borrow 50 million kwacha, but I don't have security. So I looked at him. I said, this young man looks very promising. You know? I, I told, instructed my general manager. Uh, of course, I was chairman and managing director. Give him 50 million kwacha. From that 50 million kwacha, he is worth 50 billion kwacha today as you know. And there are many Zambians that we had lent on, on that basis. I was sitting at Marlin restaurant one day. One big Zambian came to me. Hello, Mr. Div he knelt. He said, hello, Mr. Divale. How are you? Do you remember me? I looked at him. I said, no, sorry. Um, I, I pretended. I said, yes, you know, but with a silly smile. But honestly, I didn't remember him. He says, my name is so-and-so. Today, you lent me 10 million kwacha, and today I have a fleet of 100 trucks. I thank you very much for that little kind gesture you did. Honestly, I didn't know who it was, but we had so many such people. But unfortunately, banks have to balance um, between the shareholders' uh, uh, responsibility as well as the gut feeling. When you're a small bank, you can afford to do that. But you know, when you're a big bank like Barclays, Stanchart, uh, they have different uh, you know, resp responsibilities to the shareholders, etc. But otherwise, if you are if you have the passion and if you are convinced about your project, again, I say there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yep. Go to that bank, convince that manager that, that, you can, that your project is bankable. Even cry, even do whatever, you know. <laughs> even pretend to cry, you know. Convince, <laughs> knock at his door or her door and make sure that your project may be, con may be uh, accepted. But there was another question about niche. Yes, yes. The Are niche, we coming next? The niche, huh? Yeah, because yeah, I can answer afterwards. But yeah, niche. How do you recognize your niche and then how do you go beyond it? Yeah, maybe I can... Yeah, yeah, yeah that you know, I'll give you my example. When my factory started, Cleopatra Fashions, with five second hand machines, people said, there are 50 factories in Zambia. What are you, uh, what are you going to do? The pr uh, dresses were selling at 4 kwacha 95. You know, the normal dresses. Zambia fashion, Soraya dresses, etc., etc. 
So what I did is I created my own niche. I said, okay, my dresses are not going to be two, 295 or 395. My dresses are going to be 1095. See, I created my own niche. You know, Margaret Thatcher said, if you don't have a path, create your own path. That's leadership and, and entrepreneurship. So I went 1095. I said, my product is the best. It's better than the 495 uh, stuff that is selling in the market. However, I had to market it. The first year of my sales were only $50,000 in those days. But my advertising budget at that time was $25,000. You know, my accountant said, he said, are you mad? You're going to go bust very soon. How can you have 50% of your, uh, you know, of the sales as your, as, your, uh, as your advertising budget? We used to advertise in front of newspapers. Look for this label, Cleopatra Fashions, available at all leading stores in Zambia, even though it wasn't. Actually, it was a lie. <laughs> but you know, those, uh, the shops that were leading, the, oh, I'm not, I don't have Cleopatra Fashions goods. It means I am not a leading store. Can you see the reverse psychology? So that's how, and then the, the, the turnover increased by 400% every year. So by the time, by, by the time I was 31, I was worth over a million dollars. Thank you. Thank nice, you. nice, nice. Doc, we come to you. You're the one who will close for us. Uh, experiences with banks. You, you definitely are the man. Yeah, I, I think the... Um what is important for me is consistency and integrity when you are dealing with the banks. Uh, because banks want to see a person who is consistent. They want to see someone who, even when you're in a bad situation. I mean, I remember in 2005, um, and I, 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 at this particular moment, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the bank. You know, Zanaco, um, for all intent and purposes, have done us good. They've, they've made us where we are. We've grown where we are because of Zanaco, and I'm not campaigning for them, but it's a good bank. So at, at some point, we had a, a, very, a very bad experience in our business, and um, we owed the bank close to 13 million, 13 billion at that point, um, and just to cut the story short. But it is so happened that um, uh, even when we had the opportunities, uh, when we had some money coming in, the danger was we could have taken some money elsewhere. Yeah. But I would, would go back to the same bank, same, uh, same manager, and say, look, I have this money to liquidate, uh, but I need some money for my salary uh, to pay the workers. And we went on, um, and they held us. Um, and every time someone would be funny within the system, uh, the managing director would say, not this one. Because I was very consistent. Uh, to the point that after three years, uh, when we went through all this, uh, I can just walk in the bank, I want three million, I'm given. So there is a point at which it will be shaky, but be consistent. Don't run from one bank to the, to the other like a yo-yo. Be consistent, be in one place, and if you are in place, you can, you, can, you can end the trust, and they can trust you in your moment of distress. Very, very good. I think a round of applause to both of them. You, you can see for yourself that I think the big key words were consistency, there was the issue of character, charisma, integrity, ethics. These are things that were resonating from both speakers today. Key points which I think many of us as entrepreneurs can learn from them. And uh, <clears throat> in, 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 in winding up this session and then handing over to the next session, I just want to say that uh, there's two things. Number one, I love Mr. Devalier's story about sacrifice because I remember at one point when we were running our businesses, we used to drive this beat down 14, that's on 1400 and we used to have to suck fuel out of the pump to push into the carburetor. I don't know how many know about carburetors these days, that's, that's like history. And I remember we'd wait for everybody to leave the meeting before, before you do that. <laughs> so you should just make sure that everybody first goes because you don't want to see them that, they, that you're driving a on 1400 and then do this fuel thing. But it was fun. Because that was part of our experience, that's part of where we, where we grew and where we came from. And in closing, there is no way that you can have all the theory and not back it with practice. So we can learn everything that we can learn in meetings like this, in interacting with people like this. But at the end of the day, you've got to go swim. And that means you've got to take the trunks off, 
get into some swimming costume and get in the water and go to the deep end. And in that deep end, start off with somebody that will guide you as a mentor, as a guide, as a coach. And then once you get the swimming right, they'll get a point where you'll be able to swim on your own. So from myself, Reverend Walter Mwambazi, on behalf of Nyamuka Zambia, let's big, give a big round of applause as we hand over back to Kalenga. <laughs>